Hello, uh, today as part of the micro and smart systems course, we are going to uh, look at some mechanical aspects. Mechanical aspects are very important for micro systems because there are lot of elements that have to move. We are talking about solids that have to move and that analysis requires mechanical treatment. What we have on the screen uh, that we are going to see a, a suspension. Uh, a suspension is uh, called a suspension because the, the middle I shaped yellow beam that you see here is suspended by a bunch of beams, four on the left side, four on the right side. These beams suspend this mass so that it can move only in the vertical direction like this where the axis is shown here, but it will have very high stiffness to move in the perpendicular direction in this plane and also it will have very high resistance to rotation about the axis which is perpendicular to the screen. So, it is able to move freely in this direction, but very stiff to move in this direction as well as for rotate. It is a special kind of suspension meant for many micro electromechanical systems devices. One of the prominent ones is a comb drive which is where a shuttle mass will be going back and forth like the one that is shown here with electrostatic force. Another one is to use it as an, uh, an accelerometer. An accelerometer as uh, you all know senses acceleration. So, to sense that acceleration you need to have a mass which due to the inertial force caused by the acceleration will experience a force, but if there is no spring or the suspension it will just move away and that is why the suspension is necessary. In fact, the deformation of the beams that you see here these four beams on one side and four beams on another side. If you measure the displacement of the mass which is determined by the stiffness of the springs that are that is these beams then you can calibrate for acceler acceleration. That means that we have to lump this whole device as one spring mass system. Let us look at that kind of lumped modeling today. So, we saw there a, a proof mass which had four beams on one side, four beams on the other side and those all of them can be made to look like just one spring. So, this is the mass let us say this is m which is the mass of that uh, uh, central I shaped uh, pattern that we saw on the screen and then we want to have one spring constant which represents the effect of all of the beams that uh, we saw over here. Let us look at the beam one more time. So, we have this is one beam, we have four such beams on this side, four such beams here and there is a mass here. So, this mass is lumped into one single mass which is fine because there is only one mass here and of course, we neglect the mass of all these springs and these spring beams they are beams which act like springs. So, all these beams you would like to get it to just one spring of spring constant k. If we are able to do that what we can get is if there is a inertial force on this which is m times a that is the inertial force due, due to an acceleration a which is what we want to measure. In order to measure that we need to see how much displacement this mass would experience. Let us call the displacement x that x will be given by the force which is inertial force which is m times a divided by the spring constant k. How do we get this equivalent spring constant? This is equivalent because it is equivalent to the effect of all these 8 beams in this structure equivalent spring constant. We need to determine this based on the dimensions of the beams. Let us look at a few more examples before we discussed this uh, lumped modeling. We call this lumped uh, 
modeling, which is a very important concept in any field because we do not want to deal with all the details of the geometry that exists in this suspension, but get it all to just one quantity spring constant, equivalent spring constant. To look at other examples, let us switch back to this. Here we have a different device. This is a platform. What you see at the center, that is the central disc here, can move up and down in the direction perpendicular to the screen and that is enabled by these four U shaped folded beams. There are four of these, each one of them looks like this. There is a length A for this, B here, there is a width for this uh, folded beam. We have four of them which are all attached to an outer ring which is fixed. This hatching shows that it is fixed to a reference frame. And now the central disc can move up and down and act like a Z stage. Here also we would like to represent this with one mass and a spring constant, equivalent spring constant corresponding to all these four folded beams. Let us look at one more example. Here the central mass which is called the proof mass, we want it to move in the x direction that is this direction as well as y direction. So, we here we have a little coordinate system shown there, this is the x direction, y direction with complete decoupling meaning that when there is a force acting in the x direction, y direction is not affected and likewise when there is a force acting in the y direction, x direction is not affected. So, here the mass will have then two springs. So, if I go back to the lumped modeling, so for this one we can draw a lumped modeling with the mass at the center and the springs letting it move in the x direction with some stiffness. If the beams were not there, suspension is not there, it will just fly away when there is a force in the x direction. Likewise, we will have the springs in the y direction also. So, we have x direction and y direction and we have the central mass here. So, this k x here and k y here. In this particular example, the k x spring constant equivalent spring constant in the x direction happens to be equal to k y because of the symmetry that is there in this particular device. So, how do you get this k x and k y? Let us look at one more device here it is a micro mirror array where this mirror that you see this is the eye of the needle you can see on the wafer how many of them you can make and this particular mirror diameter of this is uh, about 150 to 200 microns and that is why you can pack a lot of them in a single wafer. This mirror can tilt about x axis as well as y axis. We can tilt it like this, tilt it like that and for that there are again the suspensions. We have the circular mirror at the center, there is a suspension here which enables this mirror to rotate about this y axis and, and this one is connected to a annular ring which is suspended with another pair of springs which enable this annular ring to rotate about the x axis. So, this mirror can rotate about x axis because of the annular ring and rotate about y axis because of this other spring. So, how do you get the rotational stiffness of this about x axis and y axis? So, if we look at the details of this beam suspension, it is going to look like this. We have here, if I look at this spring, it is starting one end corresponds to this end here, another end corresponds to this and here is our axis and it can twist about this axis here to make this one rotate about that axis. How do you get an equivalent spring constant for something like this? Okay. So, looking at these four examples, let us look at the lumped modeling of uh, these beams. Going back to our first example, this one, where let us look at the uh, 
spring constant of this first in the x axis that is horizontal axis. We have several beams we want to look at the stiffness of all of these beams in the x axis that is horizontal along the length of the beams. Let us look at just one of them first. If we look at just one we have axial deformation happening in these beams. If I show one of those beams here which is connected and fixed to one reference frame and then here we want to see what happens with the force in the x direction. We had this uh, uh, what we call a proof mass it can be of any shape here it happens to be that way. We will just show these uh, beams. this is somewhat a rigid portion and then we have these beams which is fixed here and fixed here. This part is not fixed it just happens to be rigid. So, that means that like mass here this is completely rigid, but not fixed to anything and these are the four beams that uh, move. So, this again is connected here. So, this goes like this and this one and similarly we have it on the right hand side. So, it is fixed here, fixed here and there is a rigid mass over there connecting them. Now, if there were to be let us call this x axis, let us call this y axis, if there were to be a inertial force on this mass m and there is m a, we would like to know what the stiffness is in that direction. So, we should look at each of these beams, let us say one of these beams I have shown like that, this force m a would act here. Let us call that force p and this force if since there are four beams here, four beams here and they are experiencing axial force due to this m a, this p we can say will be one eighth of the total inertial force m a because there are four of them sharing this force and they are all in parallel here because their force is shared this force m a is shared by each of them equally. Now, we would like to know how much it deflects. If I look at this problem we want to think about what effect of force on this beam in the axial direction. A beam that experiences force in the axial direction is called a bar. A bar moves only in the axial direction. So, it undergoes axial displacement or deformation because it is not a rigid body displacement, but actually the it elongates. If I take two points on this after deformation these two points would have moved to two different new points where the distance would have changed, distance between them would have changed that is not considered to be rigid body motion and it is called deformation. Deformation causes stress and strain in this bar. If I look at any point here, if I take a cut and look at what uh, internal force exists on that, that has to be equal to p because this element, this segment has to be in equilibrium. So, we, if I take the broken one, let us say I take this, we have this force p acting on it and I have cut here. So, this should have a force p to keep it in equilibrium. This is for static equilibrium that is a force. If we assume that the area of cross section of this bar area of cross section is equal to a then we define a quantity sigma which is called the stress in this axial stress in the normal direction to the surface of uh, uh, cross section here it is called a normal stress that is given by the force in it divided by area of cross section. Now, we can define another quantity which is very important in mechanics which is strain and that is given by the stress divided by Young's modulus. This y here is Young's modulus 
which arises because of the assumed linear relationship between the stress and strain. So, strain we will use a symbol epsilon and stress and strain related by the Young's modulus. Now, what is strain? The strain is defined as change in length that is how much deformation this undergoes let us call that uh, well let us call it delta x not x ok. Let us call that uh, delta sub x that is the change in length in the x direction divided by the original length of the bar. So, if I take this uh, length of this bar as L that is strain. Now, knowing the relation, relation between the stress and strain we can now write. So, we have strain which is delta x by L equal to stress which is P divided by A and then 1 over I. This tells us that the delta x the deflection of the bar is equal to P L force multiplied by length of the bar divided by area of cross section and Young's modulus. Now, if we look at this expression and then see that we can separate it out in this fashion P divided by A y over L. Now, this quantity can be seen as the equivalent spring constant. Okay. That means that the bar that we have, the bar that we have which is experiencing a force P can be written as a spring, a linear spring with a spring constant k which is equal to as we have shown a y by L area of cross section times Young's modulus divided by the length of the bar. Once we know this we go back here. So, we have this k equal to a y by L and we have 8 of those in this suspension. So, we can write the total stiffness of this in the x direction of the suspension. This is k x of the suspension as 8 times the spring constant we just derived which was a into y by L that gives the k x. Going back to our figure we had this suspension and this spring constant the x direction which is this k x we have derived expression. Now, if there is a force in the y direction on it which is again let us say m a y we could have called it m a x here. So, if we call it m a x this uh, force will be m a x that is a force inertial force in the x direction. Now, if there is a force in the y direction these beams now will start bending. We said that we call something a bar if it experiences only axial force whereas, if there is a force in the y direction these things experience a transverse displacement or transverse deformation we need to determine k y for it. Before we uh, proceed let us look at one more aspect of this. We had a bar several of them they all shared the force applied and that is why we call them springs in parallel. That means that if I have a bar here and another bar here connected to let us say a proof mass a very big mass which is fixed here which is fixed here based on what we just did in the x direction if there were to be a inertial force m times a x. So, this is m times acceleration in the x direction that will be m times a x. Now, we have two let us say they both have area of cross section a length l and made of material which has Young's modulus y 
and same thing for this a l and y then if you get spring constant as we just did get for one bar and take another bar which has the same spring constant you can just add because these are springs in parallel that is this is equivalent to the lumped model where we have one spring and another spring both are fixed here and we have a mass m. So, this if this spring constant is k let us say this has uh, let us make these uh, things different that is a 1 this is a 2 l 1 l 2 y 1 y 2. So, we will have two different spring constants here k 1 and k 2 where k 1 is a 1 y 1 by l 1 and k 2 is a 2 y 2 by l 2. This further can be reduced to just one spring because there are springs in parallel with an equivalent spring which is k and that k is going to be the sum of this individual springs in parallel. This is the case of parallel springs. How many ever there are you simply add because they all share the force and they have the same displacement. How does this k equal to k 1 plus k 2 come about? We know that the deflection if we denote the displacement or deflection of this by uh, as we did delta x that delta x is the f 1 the force in the bar 1 f 1 divided by k 1 and it is also uh, the same in the other one f 2 divided by k 2 because they both are attached to the same mass the mass moves by delta x they both have to move by the same amount f 1 by k 1 f 2 by k 2. But uh, we know that the force f 1 plus f 2 is equal to the total force acting on this mass because the springs in parallel share the force and this is what gives us this relationship. So, we write f 1 f 1 will be taking from here it will be k 1 times delta x k 1 times delta x plus k 2 times delta x equal to f. This gives us that delta x times k 1 plus k 2 is equal to f or delta x is f by k 1 plus k 2. So, that is what we get as the total spring constant. What if uh, these are in series as opposed to being in parallel? Let us take that example of a bar where we draw this bar of certain cross section. Let us say there is a change in cross section like this. which is fixed here and we have the narrower cross, cross section let us call this a 1 l 1 and x modulus y 1. For this part the area of cross section is a 2 length is uh, l 2 and modulus y 2 y 1 y 2 can be the same, but we are taking a general case where they are different. Now, this can be represented as spring 1 and then spring 2 if there is a force f acting on it we will need to get an equivalent spring constant for this example. So, let us say this point that is this point moves by x 2 that is this is moves by uh, x 2 and this moves by x 1. Then we have to see what will be the equivalent spring constant here what we would like to get is these two we want to get to one spring where there is a force f we want to get this k equivalent to k 1 and k 2. So, here what we notice is whether we take the first spring or the second spring they both experience the same force because if I were to take a cut over here and draw the spring it has to experience a force f here and reaction force f there. 
and this displacement we know is 0 because it is fixed and this displacement is x 1. So, we can write that and this since this is k 1 which is k 1 we will write one more time it will be a 1 y 1 by l 1 and knowing the displacement or elongation of this will be x 1 minus 0 or just x 1 we will get x 1 to be equal to f divided by k 1. Likewise, if we take this portion that spring let us draw it. So, this is moving by an amount x 2 this is moving by an amount x 1 the difference of that will be the elongation in the spring and we have a force the same force f acting on it. So, we can write x 2 minus x 1 which is the deflection of the spring elongation of the spring. If x 2 is more than x 1 it is elongation if x 2 is less than x 1 it will be compression or contraction of the spring that can be written as the force divided by the spring constant k 2 of this and k 2 will have the same form, but area of cross section 2 a 2 y 2 by l 2. If we have this our aim is to get the k equivalent here looking at these two expressions and the equivalent one we will have another expression which will be the x 2 that we see here this point will move by an amount x 2 just as here we can write x 2 equal to f divided by k equivalent I will just write it as k e q. So, if I now take these expressions that one and that one and put it into here. So, we have x 2 minus x 1 x 2 is f divided by k equivalent minus x 1 which is f divided by k 1 equal to f k 2. So, we have gotten this by substituting for x 2 and x 1 from here and here. Now, we see the same forces everywhere. So, we can write by taking this other side this term first we can cancel f throughout because the same force acts there on all of them. So, now we can take it the other side. So, we get 1 over k equivalent equal to 1 over k 1 this goes other side becomes a plus sign plus 1 over k 2. Now, for springs in series these are springs in series for the spring seri in series we have to take harmonic sum that is the reciprocal of the k equivalent is equal to the sum of the reciprocals and that is why we can write k equivalent as k 1 k 2 by k 1 plus k 2 the harmonic sum of the two spring constants. So, we have to remember that when we take uh, several beams that are there in a suspension we have to identify whether individual springs correspond to the beams are in series or in parallel and accordingly do this summation. This applies to whether it is axial spring that is a spring that models in a lumped form the axial deformation of a elastic element such as a beam or transverse it does not matter when you identify them as lumped elements the springs in series and parallel is a useful concept. Now, going back to our uh, example looking at this uh, suspension we determine the equivalent in the x direction that is x direction here. We would like to do now for the y direction if there is a acceleration and inertial force m a y there. Now, we have to see how these beams deform. So, for that we have to look at this beam and then see how it deforms. Uh, just to give you an idea as uh, how it looks when it deforms let us look at uh, one result of a finite element analysis about which you will learn later in this course as well as you can look at standard textbooks and finite element analysis or look at uh, a course content that describes this method. What this method does is given any arbitrary shaped structure when you uh, want to analyze its deformation you have to solve a differential equation 
and it is a numerical method finite element analysis numerical method which gives you solution of differential equations. Here one of the results is shown where we see these uh, beams which are bent right there we had four beams we are looking at the left side of course there are four beams on the right side as well and this mass has moved and each of these beams has deformed right. So, this deformation if you see if I look at this beam beam A beam A is fixed at one end the other end it is able to move in the x direction, but if you see the slope here is 0 the slope here is 0 because it is fixed the slope of this beam and here also it is 0 because it is attached to a rigid element that is movable in the vertical direction, but does not allow it to rotate. So, this kind of a beam is called a fixed guided beam which we will consider now to see how we can determine the deflection of that one beam. Let us look at the deflection of that one beam. So, I draw that beam which was fixed at this end it was guided that is what this is called it was guided here so that it can move up and down when there is force on it it is fixed here. So, how would it deform we saw that it was deforming because it can move in the direction, but needs to have a 0 slope. So, it starts from a 0 slope here and that ends up having 0 slope there that is how it will going to deform there are these rollers imagine them this is called a guided support. So, we would like to know if there is a force acting on this in this direction how much would it move if I say this is my delta y because you can remember that we have our x axis in this direction and y axis in this direction. So, there is a force here due to that acceleration of y direction we would like to know how much this delta y is for that we need to analyze these beams for that we need to know first the reaction forces that one would feel at this end as well as at this end. If I take this beam let us take uh, the in the undeformed shape we have fixed this beam completely here. So, that means that it cannot move in the upward direction. So, since it is restrained from moving in the upward direction there must be a force holding it which we call reaction force. So, we are going to have a reaction force here F y and this ok. Likewise, it is not allowed to move in the x direction. So, it must have a reaction force in the x direction f x ok at the this end we are looking at this end. So, it is fixed in the x direction there is a force reaction force reaction force likewise not allowed to rotate there. So, there must be a movement about the z axis z axis here is perpendicular to the screen. So, there will be a movement reaction movement. So, these are reactions because you are not allowing it to move it will develop a reaction. So, at the other end what will be that it is able to move in the y direction. So, there is no reaction in the y direction at this end whereas, there will be reaction in the x direction here we should call this really indicate the uh, left side. So, this is the left side this is the right side left side. Uh, so, this is the right side this is also right side. So, it is not allowed to rotate here. So, there must be a reaction here m z on the left side direction. So, we have to know what reactions exist once we know what reactions exist then we can draw the bending moment diagram for this we can compute bending moment. Once we know bending moment we can determine how much it deflects and from the deflection we can get the, the tip delta y and use that to get our equivalent spring constant. So, if there is a force acting let us say the force here is uh, uh, f y the y direction then the spring constant of this uh, beam in the transverse direction 
that is y direction of this beam will be that force f y divided by delta y. So, we know this force because we can look at the beams that are there. So, if we go back, uh, if we go back uh, to the diagram where we wrote this uh, suspension, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 beams here, 4 beams here. If we analyze whether they are all identical, they will have the same spring constant in the y direction or x direction, but you need to analyze whether in series or parallel. So, once we know that, we know the total force, how they share that. So, we can take this m a y and take that portion back to our model here and put that as f y. Once you know f y, if I can somehow get this delta y, then I can determine k y. That is the goal here. How do we get this k y? That means, that how do you get this quantity delta y? Right. So, before that, as uh, we just said, we need to know what reactions act and we need to determine those, these two quantities, these three quantities. Once we know them, we can draw the bending moment diagram or we can compute bending moment. So, bending moment is critical to determine in deflections. So, the m that we have the reaction moment, but if I take a section of this anywhere, I can again show the uh, vertical reaction and uh, horizontal internal force, you do not call it a reaction now, because it is internal and there will be a, uh, a movement. Notice that all of these we are writing uh, in the positive direction, these are positive x direction, positive y direction and positive direction for movement either reaction movement or bending movement is counterclockwise. So, in fact, let us call this only m rather than m z that is a bending moment, we call it bending moment, because the effect of this is to bend the beams bending moment. Once you know the bending moment, we can determine uh, the deflection, because we know from beam theory, this is we need to know. Euler Bernoulli beam theory, which is usually discussed in a strength of materials or mechanics of materials course, which I am sure you can find in many standard textbooks. One of the good textbooks to look at the strength of materials is by S. P. Timoshenko, author's name, and uh, this is title The Strength of Materials. There is another good book, this is one book. Another book is by Den Hertog, and this also has the same title. There are many other books on strength of materials. If you read them, you will know what this Euler Bernoulli beam theory is, and once we are able to get this bending moment, we can get the deformation because we know that the uh, curvature of the beam as it uh, bends is proportional to the bending moment. The more the bending moment, the more the curvature. So, uh, rho here is the radius of curvature rho is the radius of curvature. Radius of curvature determines or in fact the reciprocal determines the curvature, because if radius of curvature for a straight line is infinity, so its curvature is 0, because if I take a straight line its radius is somewhere very far at infinity. So, its inverse means that curvature is 0. So, you, on the other hand if I have a circular arc which will have a center here, then this becomes the radius of curvature. So, we have this here that is a row. 
So, it shows how much is bending and that is called the curvature. So, 1 over rho this quantity rho is radius of curvature this is curvature. So, curvature is proportional to moment if you are able to determine the reaction moments here and then taking a section everywhere we can compute this bending moment and once we do that here we get this relationship and we also know that uh, 1 over rho the constant proportionality here is uh, m by e i. Based on this where uh, well let us use uh, uh, y i y i where y again is Young's modulus. and I is area moment of inertia, area moment of inertia for the cross section. So, the cross section plays an important role in how much the beam is going to bend because of the bending moment. So, we need to have that come here as i which is given by integrating over the area of cross section area of cross section the quantity y square t a that is the moment area moment of inertia and material angst modulus is there and we have the radius of curvature and radius of curvature is uh, given by uh, if we de denote the deformation of a beam let us say a beam deforms like this if I denote this as w x where from the starting end of the beam if you measure x w x is w at different points. Okay. If I take second derivative let us write it as w double prime that is d square w by d x square where the first derivative would be simply d w by dx. Then we can write this uh, curvature as w double prime divided by 1 plus w prime square raised to 3 over 2 that is equal to 1 over rho. This comes from geometry. You substituted it over there then you get relation between w double prime and this m that we have. What we do in small displacements is to neglect this quantity. Look at this, this is 1 plus w prime square. If the beam bending is very small, I have shown here exaggerated fashion, but if you take small displacements, then w prime will be very small, w prime square will be much smaller. 1 plus something that is very small, we can approximate it to 1. So, we can say this is equal to just simply w double prime that is this that is equal to m. So, we get from here m is equal to y i times w double prime that is d square w by d x square. If we know bending moment we can integrate it twice to solve for w and the w here is what we want because if you recall what we want is this deflection. If I know w of x of this beam everywhere, it will be easy matter to know how much it is over there. But then we have to first determine the reaction moments, get the bending moment, go to this differential equation that too it is only for small displacements, determine w of x everywhere and then substitute at one end to the w del delta y which we need here to get our lumped modeling. But we can avoid all that by using a, an energy theorem which is called Castigliano's theorem. So, a shortcut we want to find a shortcut to find delta y which for us w at x equal to 0 because we have a beam we have a beam which is fixed at one end and guided at 
this other end you want to determine this delta y. So, if I my x is starting here at this point x is equal to 0 and what we are saying is when this deforms let us choose a different color it is going to go to that point we would like to know this is our w that is w x everywhere at x equal to 0 we want to know delta y and that is what we would like to have. A shortcut to find delta y is given by a theorem known as Castiglianos theorem which is an energy theorem an energy theorem which are convenient for a certain calculation such as this one and the energy involved here is a strain energy. Let us write what the strain energy is. The strain energy is uh, integral of sigma that we introduced earlier stress times strain half of it over the volume of the body. In other words stress times strain if I were to take a graph where I have stress here strain here if I have a curve like this or a straight line in the case of linear things the slope of this is given by the Young's modulus because we know that stress is equal to y times epsilon where y is the Young's modulus. The area under this curve this area is half sigma epsilon 2 and that is called the strain energy density. So, this is strain energy per unit volume strain energy per unit volume that is strain energy density strain energy density if I integrate it over the entire volume I will get the strain energy expression. For the case of beams this strain energy can be written the strain energy which we will denote by two letters S E strain energy for beams is given by integration from 0 to L. We have to reduce this volume to length after doing an integration the area of cross section. For the derivation of this we can look up a book on strength of materials. It will be given by uh, Young's modulus which we have been using y here. Yeah, this is uh, given by the moment bending moment square by 2 times Young's modulus times moment of inertia i dx. So, if we have a beam we can determine bending moment that is uh, absolutely necessary, but what we are trying to avoid is as following the differential equation using an energy method which is classical Lenard's theorem. If I do this integration m square by 2 y i of this then what Castiglianos theorem says is Castigliano theorem says that uh, the deflection at a point let us say u at somewhere is equal to the derivative of the strain energy with respect to the force correspond to this one. Okay. So, this is the displacement that we want at a point at that point if there is a force right. Then we write the strain energy the strain energy we should write in terms of that force. Okay. In fact, that will be true for this beam because this beam we apply a force f and try to get the bending moment. So, bending moment here will be in terms of that force y is a material property i is a geometric property of the beam. So, we can have this whole expression of integration come in terms of this force f 
Now, if we take a partial derivative of that, we get the displacement. So, once we do this, we can determine this u just at the point where we want without having to solve the differential equation. So, that is a shortcut using Castiglione's method. There is another Castiglione's uh, theorem which says the force is given by the partial derivative of that with respect to displacement. So, f and u are the conjugate quantities at any point if you apply a force you cause some displacement other hand if you were to grab something that is you are causing a displacement then there will be a force. So, force and displacement are conjugate related to each other you can have this thing. So, this is called Castiglione's first theorem and this is Castiglione's second theorem. We use that Castiglione's theorem here to compute this deflection at the end without having to solve this differential equation. So, here you have bending moment an expression you get and then you have to integrate it twice to get the deflection everywhere that is w of x and then determine delta y w at x equal to 0 instead you can use the Castiglione's theorem. This is one very powerful way to obtain lumped models of elastic beams such as the ones you find. Now, going back to our motivating examples. So, for this what you see for this beams we can use Castiglione's theorem to get the deflection at one point and for these beams as well and these beams or any other beams that you find you can easily get the lumped models because Castiglione's theorem and energy method enables you to compute the uh, deflection at one point without having to solve the differential equation. And uh, once we have the deflection we can go back and uh, use our lumped modeling that is the force divided by the deflection that is this quantity we can get the spring constant k and seeing whether the springs are in series or parallel we can get the total spring constant of that. So, let us look at the example uh, of the suspension by 8 beams which is called a folded beam suspension which is what we see here. Now, for each of these beams first we need to use Castiglione's theorem to get an equivalent spring constant in the vertical direction which is given by the way by this quantity the f l cube by 12 y i or in other words k which is force divided by delta which will be y t w cube t is the depth of the beam w cube is the width of the beam raised to the power 3 divided by length of the beam raised to the power 3. So, this is the spring constant in the vertical direction and we have to see that each of the beams in the suspension all of them have this k which is given by y t w cube by l cube and how are they arranged in series and parallel. If you look at the four beams here we have labeled them a, b, c and d. You can notice that if you follow beam a from its fixed end to here and here you will notice that these two are in series because this moves a little bit this rigid mass moves with it and then with respect to rigid mass this point moves more because this is folded back like this. So, a b are springs in series they have the same force, but not the same displacement. So, a and b are in series we can get if this is k this is k both of them together will become 2 k and likewise the beams c and d are also in series. So, we get k k uh, which is uh, uh, sorry k k these are in series. So, we get actually half of k as the equivalent spring constant for these and half of k here and now this assembly this assembly the one put in blue dash line box and red dash line box are in parallel as you can see because they share the same displacement. So, this is k by 2 this k by 2 overall it will be k and then this set of beams on the left side and set of beams on the right side are in parallel the total thing here will be 2 times k. So, we can get the total spring constant of uh, this particular suspension. So, we look at each beam and do this. One more thing that we need to uh, uh, keep in mind uh, to end this discussion is what happens when you have beams of different uh, 
boundary conditions. So, this what you are seeing the scrolling on the screen is uh, basically the strength of materials which you can find in the two books that I mentioned. Now, let us look at the beams of different uh, boundary conditions. Left side we have shown all of them as fixed, right side this is completely free. So, this will not have any reactions at this end at the right end because it is completely free that is called fixed free no reaction moments. So, you need to get only these 3 and for a planar case you have 3 equilibrium forces in x direction can be balanced, y direction can be balanced and a rotation can be balanced. So, we can get with 3 equation these 3 quantities and you can get the bending moment here and then apply Castagliano's theorem to get the equivalent spring constant of this in the x direction y direction as well as the slope that is if I want to denote it by the torsional spring I could also do that. Now, when I have fixed on both sides then I have a quantity like this and this is called a statically indeterminate beam which means that we cannot determine the reactions here without knowing the deflection of the beam, but that situation can be resolved by using Castigliano's theorem. Again you can refer to standard books on strength of materials and if there was a pin condition like this here then there will not be reaction moment. If it is fixed and sliding at this end it can freely rotate there is no moment it can freely move in the x direction. So, there is no x reaction force only y reaction force this concept of free body diagram that is if I take a situation make it a free body drawing the reaction forces is a very important. Uh, element of strength of materials. Once you get these then you can get the bending moment and apply Castagliano's theorem and determine the deflections and then lumped spring constants seeing springs in series are parallel you can get the total lumped spring constant for any other thing that we saw we can get these lumped constants whether there are correspond to the uh, fixed rotation things it cannot rotate there will be a torsional spring constant you can get the k of that as well as k x and k y for any system. So, it is a uh, if we start with the free body diagram concept go to the beam analysis get bending moment get the strain energy take partial derivative and get the deflection and force divided by deflection gives you the equivalent lumped spring constant. So, with this we have discussed how suspension of micro system devices can be lumped into uh, just a few springs and masses which makes it reduce degrees of freedom. So, we can easily solve. Uh, in the next lecture, we will look at uh, more types of deformations of elastic bodies and uh, look at how we will analyze them. Thank you.